Hey everybody, Craig Deleuze here on behalf of the Firearms Policy Coalition. And if you're like me, I know that you were excited to hear about our groundbreaking victory in overturning California's unconstitutional assault weapons ban. But if we're honest with ourselves, this is only the beginning. Because California's anti-gun politicians have already announced that they plan to appeal. Folks, this could go all the way to the Supreme Court. Nonetheless, it's important that we celebrate and understand exactly what this case means. And so that's why we're here today. We want to talk with you a little bit about what the Miller v. Becerra, or now Miller v. Bonta case, is actually about, and kind of give you an inside look at some of what happened during the trial. Well, Miller versus Becerra, as it was called then, is uh, the our challenge to the California's assault weapons law, in particular, the uh, the features-based definition of assault weapon under California's law, which has been in existence since roughly 2000. And this act is basically, it prohibits the, the possession, manufacture, use, transfer of, quote, assault weapons, which are largely semi-automatic centerfire rifles with certain characteristics and what the state calls uh, you know, a non-fixed magazine. Um, so basically, if you can detach your magazine with push of a button or without the disassembly of the firearm action and you have stuff like a pistol grip or a collapsible stock or a flash hider on your gun, it's considered an assault weapon under California law and a felony. You, you can't own that, you can't manufacture it, you can't possess it in any way. So they define a category of firearms as assault weapons based on a whole bunch of characteristics that really have no public safety or constitutional significance. And they say, we're just gonna ban that category. So while we know this isn't the first time that an assault weapons ban like this has been challenged in court, this is a unique case. Well, as far as we are aware, this was the first chance that anyone's really had to take a case to trial that uh, is a challenge to a, a definition of assault weapon um, and to actually put the state to the test to make them justify why their definitions based on things like pistol grips, flash hiders, um, other types of features, what makes these more particularly deadly and uh, bannable on firearms as opposed to any other semi-automatic firearm. So the stage is set. The state of California is finally going to prove that those scary features are a danger to society. Or are they? The, the problem California says is there are a lot of mass shootings and these scary looking weapons that have pistol grips or that have uh, forward pistol grips or that are painted black. I'm joking about the last one, of course. Uh, but for the moment, eventually they'll do that. Uh, so these scary looking guns are more dangerous than any other gun. And so we want to stop mass shooting, so we have to stop these scary looking guns. And it turns out, A, it's not at all clear that those scary looking guns are responsible for mass shootings. Most mass shootings are actually committed by with handguns. Um, it's not at all clear that they are more lethal in any way than, say, a non-assault weapon. Uh, certain firearms permitted by California actually shoot the same bullets at the same speed, with the same muzzle velocity, with the same impact if they happen to hit you as a so-called assault weapon. So, you know, there's not really a good fit between the guns they restrict and the problem they claim to be solving. The state tries to make these claims that assault weapons are more deadly, but the state's own evidence says that assault weapon type firearms do not operate any differently than other comparable semi-automatics, nor do they fire more lethal ammunition. So how can you say something's more deadly when it's the same as any other type of gun? Uh, again, they, they try to make this claim that assault weapons are uh, a large threat to law enforcement in the, the you know, that the ammunition is uh, armor piercing ammunition. Well, the thing they leave out is that any rifle ammunition is armor piercing to soft body armor. And anyone who has any experience in firearms knows this. Soft body armor that's most commonly worn by police officers stops handgun rounds. That's what they use. They do not wear plate carrier vests. What their argument boils down to is that the state doesn't want to allow citizens to have accurate firearms, which of course is just completely in absurd in itself. I mean, that's an absurd proposition to say that firearms can be too accurate. These are better 
firearms. They do their job better. Hence, they're more dangerous, so we should ban them. So it boiled down to, we should ban guns that are good at what guns do. Anyone who's followed firearms policy knows that it's highly technical and that there are very few people who truly understand firearms, firearms technology, firearms law, and the firearms industry and how they all intersect. And oftentimes, well, those folks don't sit on the bench. I think it's a fair observation that many judges and even legislate legislators these days are not as familiar with firearms as perhaps they were at earlier stages of our nation's history, where firearms were common, almost every household had one. Uh, they were not an unusual thing that people were terrified of. Uh, but that being said, guns are different. And so it leads legislatures to say, well, gee, uh, that last bad guy used a gun that looked like this. So I'm just going to ban all guns that look like this, not realizing that these are cosmetic features on the whole, or that that feature is not the essentials of a firearm. Uh, and so there is a certain misunderstanding, uh, though I will say that I think there are enough, at least legislators, that do understand firearms and are fomenting such misunderstandings on purpose to make certain scary looking guns seem more scary than they, they might otherwise be to help get support to ban them. In this particular case, the judge went out of his way to understand the technology surrounding the AR-15 and to understand exactly why the state was arguing that it should be banned. I think that the judge was very fair in his um, treatment of firearms as, first of all, not being any some type of uh, inherently evil nuisance, but just taking it from a neutral um, perspective that these are tools and implements, um, just like any others, um, that can be used for good or for evil. Um, and it took the approach from there. I think he was not willing to accept, simply accept the state's arguments at face value, like, um, you know, many other courts might have, um, that where they simply accept the, the state's argument at face value that the weapons themselves or the features themselves are inherently more, make the firearm inherently more dangerous. The question is, okay, that's what the state is saying. Now prove it. Now show us how the uh, presence of a flash hider on a firearm is going to make a, uh, a firearm more inherently deadly, or what's the rationale for something like prohibiting a telescoping or collapsible stock on an AR-15. An example of what I had spoken about, about not simply accepting the state's um, um, arguments at face value. One of the arguments that the state makes um, in, pro in prohibiting, um, for example, upholding a minimum length requirement for a rifle, right? Because the, the, the federal um, minimum length requirement is 26, but the state minimum length requirement is 30 inches or a discussion about the collapsible stock. So what makes this a prohibitable feature? Well, the state's argument was trying to be, well, making these firearms collapsible, having a collapsible telescoping stock makes it more concealable, and therefore you can easily put it into a backpack or conceal it some other way, uh, which makes it more inherently dangerous. But one of the things we pointed out was on cross-examination of the uh, state's firearms expert is that, well, isn't it true that on an AR-15, you can simply um, remove the takedown pin, separate the upper and the lower, and put it into a backpack? And the and they had to concede that fact, and that it didn't take any particular level of skill, and that anyone can do it in a matter of two or three seconds, simply remove the pins, and there you have uh, a total uh, a, a AR-15 that is capable of being assembled or disassembled. The judge wanted to see this for himself, so he simply called up one of the marshals um, to bring up an AR-15 uh, from the armory, and it was done in a matter of minutes, and uh, the judge was able to uh, see for himself just how easily it was to remove the pins, uh, separate the upper and the lower, and, um, and I think that put that the state's argument really to rest that somehow a collapsible stock itself or a telescoping stock made it more inherently concealable. I mean, I think it just, 
um, outline the absurdity of the state's position. But it was nice to have a judge who was willing to actually lay hands on an AR-15 and understand that what was actually being talked about. So what what this video that Adam Kraut demonstrated, and Adam's just an attorney, I mean, he's probably a, a above average shooter. Um, you know, fans of Adam will, will know that, that he's, you know, he's a decent shooter, but he's not specifically trained or anything like that. He, he was able to take the same rifle in both a feature uh, in a standard AR-15 configuration and a featureless configuration, and basically still be able to hit a man-sized target at 25 uh, yards uh, rapidly. Um, and to do a magazine change with um, really negligible time difference. And I think the judge really thought that that this uh, video was, was interesting. FPC's legal team did a phenomenal job and their commitment to the Second Amendment, the Constitution, and liberty as a whole is ultimately what led to their success. I, I, you know, I've been involved with firearms for, you know, my entire adult life. And uh, this was one of the big ones that I thought was the most ludicrous uh, types of restrictions and laws because it just simply doesn't make any sense. Uh, to work on this was a huge honor, uh, and I had a fantastic time uh, working with the people, Fires Policy Coalition, Second Amendment Foundation, California Gun Rights Foundation, uh, and, and all the other attorneys that I, I worked with. We had a fantastic team. Uh, we worked extremely well together, uh, and, and we made some really good, solid arguments uh, that I think the, the court listened to. I was very honored. Um, to be a, a part of this case, which I think ultimately will have some historic value. Um, and to, to finally be able to, like I said, present the case that these, that the state's prohibitions are irrational, that they don't uh, actually achieve anything. And we finally put this state to the test and say, in, in making them justify th these prohibitions. And I, it was very, um, I was very proud to be a part of that to to finally put the the state to the test for these types of propositions. It is less about some deep and abiding concern over firearms themselves, whether I want to personally have you know this gun or that gun in my home, and it's more about respect for the Constitution. Like I said, I'm really a constitutional lawyer at heart. The Second Amendment is one of a variety of examples of constitutional principles that I fight for. I do a lot of First Amendment work. I do a lot of religious liberty work. Um, and I care more about the overarching jurisprudence of how do we respect and protect constitutional rights, even when we think they're wrong. Because at the end of the day, whether I think a constitutional right is good or bad, or you think it's good or bad, it's part of the Constitution. And if we want to have an orderly system of government that we can all respect, we have to have a process for deciding if it's in the Constitution, I'm going to protect it. If I don't like it, I'll try to amend it. Maybe I'll get it changed. And we have that debate as a political debate. But once it gets to the courts and once it's part of the Constitution, we should treat it with respect. Because otherwise, if we don't respect this right, how are we going to respect any other rights that sort of come to the point where, well, we don't really like that one so much either. That one's sort of getting in the way of something I want to do. So let's just ignore that one. That can't be the way a Constitution works. So as I said in the beginning, this fight is far from over. We need you to be a part of the fight. All you have to do is go to joinfpc.org. That's joinfpc.org and become a member today. Folks, it's just really that simple. Remember, this is a fight for our civil rights. We got to use them or we're going to lose them. We'll talk to you guys later. If you like our videos, follow, subscribe, like and share.